Welcome to the Remedies video lecture series. This is lecture one and this lecture will cover contract damages generally and buyer's remedies more specifically under the UCC. Let's get started. To begin with there are generally three forms of damages. There is expectancy, reliance, and restitution. We will cover expectancy and reliance in this section and at the end of the semester we will discuss more specifically restitution. So let's take a look at these. Uh, first of all, all damages are paid in the form of money. This will control several things that occur as a result and many of the general principles that will apply. However, there are rare instances where performance will be required as well. This will be covered in the equity section under specific performance. There are generally three components to contract damages. There are general damages which are presumed to flow directly from the contract. That is those damages that occur um, directly from the breach. The failure to deliver, the uh, breaching of the contract, the failure to deliver conforming goods are some examples of these. There are incidental damages. Now these flow directly and are related to the contract, but they are different from the actual breach. These are repairs to goods that may have been delivered that were defective, the storage of goods that may be delivered that are defective, the transportation of these goods are just some examples. Finally, there are consequential damages. These arise from sources external to the contract. These would occur only because of things that happen outside the contract. The predominant example of this are profits from the resell of goods. Where a buyer buys something, let's say tires, from the manufacturer, runs a tire store, and resells those. Well, if the manufacturer delivers the tires without any defects on time, without a breach of contract, the tire seller the store may not sell any of those tires because it has no customers or it may resell them. However, if the contract is breached, it may lose this income. But this is a result of factors external to the contract. Several general principles will apply throughout contract damages, whether they are the contract of goods, construction contracts, rental contracts, and these are expectancy and reliance are not to punish the breaching party but to compensate the non-breaching party. But also they are not to overcompensate. The non-breaching party is not expected to get a windfall in both expectancy and reliance damages. In addition, the election of remedies is generally disfavored. That is, one remedy generally will not preclude other available remedies. If the one remedy fails, there may be others that can be available. For an example of this is the Gruber case where the plaintiff was not able to offer sufficient proof of their expectancy damages and the court permitted a showing of reliance in place of it. Now, other general principles. The doctrine of avoidable consequences. This is essentially the duty to mitigate. Where harm or cost can be avoided or reduced, all parties must do so. Again, this grows out of the idea that the prevalent point of view is that damages are not to punish, but only to compensate. Other general principles. The doctrine of proportionality. Expectancy damages cannot exceed the harm suffered. Now, how do we determine this? Generally, this is measured by the lesser, lesser of the expectancy or reliance and the difference between what was delivered and its fair market value. Another burden of proof. The party claiming damages must prove to a reasonable certainty the amount that they are claiming. And remember, the operative words here are reasonable certainty, not to an absolute certainty. So let's take a look at some examples of some of this. We're going to look at 
the doctrine of proportionality in the context of expectancy damages. And the case that I'm going to talk about is Eastlake Construction in your book at 393. So, what was promised in this case? Well, clearly what was promised was a five-unit condominium built to specifications. And that was the expectancy. That's what the plaintiff, in this case the defendants, because Eastlake was the plaintiff, but they were suing for non-payment. The defendants countersued, and they were the actual prevailing parties. But they expected, the party expected, the non-breaching party expected to have a five-unit condominium built to its specifications. What was delivered? What was delivered was not what was expected. That was the breach. In that instance, they failed to do a number of things that they had contracted for in building this condominium. Remember, again, the purpose of damages is to make the non-breaching party whole, but not to provide a windfall and not to punish the breaching party. As a result of this, how do we meet this expectancy? Well, how normally would one expect to meet an expectancy in a contract for the building of a condominium? The expectancy would be met when the condominium is built to requirements. That's the fairly easy question to answer. But when the condominium is not built to requirements, what are some ways that the expectancy can be met? Well, one is to repair or cure the defect and as the courts will say it, repair or cure the defect without undue expense to bring it into conformity. That is, if wires weren't put in, put in the wires. If the floors weren't installed right, install new floors. If cabinets were installed wrong, take them out and put, in, put them in right. If the lighting wasn't correct, put in correct lighting. All of these are examples. However, if it cannot be remedied without undue expenditure, then the courts will look to the difference in value of the building as it is and the value as it would have been. So here what they're doing is looking at the value. They're taking the value of the building as produced, the building that is in breach, and looking at its value compared to what would have been the value if the building had been built properly. Now, the reason for doing this is that if the cost of repairs far exceed the difference in the value as produced and the value that would have been, what would a normal plaintiff do if, again, remember, we are only paying money here. A normal plaintiff, if they were given the money to cure the defects and, let's say, the building is only worth $100,000, the, and with the defects it's worth $80,000, but to cure it, to fix it, is going to cost $50,000. Well, if a normal plaintiff were given the $50,000, they would sell the building for $80,000 and keep the $50,000, thereby obtaining an excess profit of $30,000 from the defendant. This, in essence, would create a windfall for the plaintiff more than they had bargained for. They only bargained for a $100,000 building. And what they got in exchange was an $80,000 building. But if we made them, if we made the defendant in that instance pay them to cure the defects, they would obtain an extra $30,000 from what they bargained for. And contract damages, again, are to make the plaintiff whole or to give them what they expected, but not to give them more than that. And that's what we see playing out here in this instance. Okay, let's start looking at the sale of goods remedies. And this is covered under the Uniform Commercial Code, Section 2, covers the sale of goods. And the Uniform Commercial Code defines goods as all things which are movable at the time of identification to the contract for sale. This is just about most things we can think of 
that we go out and purchase or that anyone would go out and purchase parts uh, that would go into manufacturing something are considered the sale of goods. Consumer goods are for the most part under the sale of goods. There are some questions that are still being developed today as to whether software is considered the sale of goods. In some instances courts have found software to be a good. In other instances they found software to be a service and not covered by the UCC. But for the most part there won't be much question whether the item that is being uh, sold or purchased is a good. And as a result Section 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code and the remedies found in Section 2 will cover the sale of these goods. So let's take a look at what the UCC provides. Let's start with when the seller breaches, that is buyer's remedies. And we're going to talk about these uh, for the rest of this video lecture. UCC 2-711 catalogs buyer's remedies and it provides that in part a buyer may cancel and recover so much of the price paid when the seller is in breach of the contract but this isn't the only remedy in addition the buyer may cover and have damages under 712 and we'll talk about this more in a minute or recover damages under 2-713 or recover damages for accepted goods under 2-714 or obtain specific performance under 2-716 in certain situations and finally recover liquidated damages under 2-718 if they are provided in the contract. The rest of this video session will cover sections 2-711 through 2-715. We will cover specific performance in the equity section and we will cover liquidated damages after color covering seller's remedies. So let's begin with a review of buyer's remedies when a seller breaches. To begin with, the first section we're going to talk about is 2-712. This section provides cover by making in good faith and without reasonable delay any reasonable purchase in substitution. This is where the seller fails to deliver a good or provide a good and the buyer goes out and obtains a substitute for that good. So if it's tires, they go out and buy other tires. If it's a car, they go out and buy a different car. If it's kitchen equipment, they go out and buy different kitchen equipment, etc. But they go out and buy. This, in part, flows from the buyer's duty to mitigate. If they can reduce the seller's damages, they must do so. Um, and that's where cover comes into play. Now, the recovery, the damage measurement under cover is the difference in the cost of cover and the contract price. This is the general damage that flows from the cover. The difference in the cost of cover, what they had to pay for the substitute goods, and what the contract provided for. Plus, incidental and consequential damages minus expenses saved by the breach. There will be instances where the breach will save money for the buyer and in these instances those expenses that are saved are subtracted from the damages. We will talk more in a few minutes about incidental and consequential damages. If for some reason the, s the buyer does not cover they are not able to cover, they are not able to cover sufficiently, or in total, there are other remedies available. And that takes us to 713 for non-delivery or repudiation. This is where the seller does not deliver, or where the seller informs the buyer in advance of delivery 
that they will not be delivering and they are going to breach the contract. Here the damages are the difference in the market price at the time when the buyer learned of the breach and the contract price. Again this is the general damage that flows from this and we will talk a little later about the condition here when the buyer learned of the breach. As you will read in your book this becomes relevant when price is in the market, when market price is fluctuating either up or down. Plus again incidental and consequential damages provided in 2-715 less any expenses saved again as a result of the breach. Finally 2-714 covers accepted goods when there has been a breach when the buyer accepts the goods. In this instance it's the difference at the time and place of acceptance between the value of the goods as accepted and the value is warranted. Okay, and w by warranted, it's what was contracted for. So if the buyer and seller contract to deliver goods of a certain specification and those goods are not delivered, then the damage is, and the buyer decides to accept them and repair them, fix them, do something to them then it's the difference in the value of the goods as accepted and the value as warranted. Again, plus incidental and consequential damages under Section 715 in certain circumstances. So these are the three predominant remedies that flow to a buyer when a seller breaches. So finally let's talk about 2-715. This is the section that covers incidental damages which as you can see here include expenses reasonably incurred in various things that are directly related to the contract such as inspection, receipt, transportation, care, custody of the goods uh, that are rightfully rejected and any other commercially reasonable charges. As you can see, this directly relates to the goods that were in breach and will flow from the contract. Next, under this section, we have consequential damages. As I said earlier, these are generally damages that are derived from sources external to the contract. And in this instance, this definition is that they include loss from general or particular requirements and needs of which the seller at the time of contracting had reason to know and which could not be prevented by cover or otherwise. That is, which could not be prevented from a general form of mitigation. Okay, so now what are some of these and we'll look at them in more detail and they're explored in the cases, but generally one of these would be lost profits. So if the buyer of the goods is in the business of reselling those goods, an external factor to a breach of the contract would be a loss of these profits. So if the seller, um, if the buyer owns a tire store and they buy tires from a tire manufacturer, and they resell those tires and the tire manufacturer delivers goods that are defective or fails to deliver those goods then the buyer who then resells them will not make profits as a result of that but the failure to make profits will come about because of the breach but also by factors external to the breach of the contract and these are lost profits. Other incidences of these could be other contracts that are breached as a result of the failure of the seller to deliver or when they deliver non-conforming goods and then the buyer has to breach those contracts and suffer damages. This could also be an example of a consequential damage. So this chart shows to some extent how these all play out. 2-711 provides for cover 
under 712 provides for a difference in contract and market price under 713 and provides for damages under 714 for goods that were delivered and accepted but did not conform to the contract. And all three of those provide in certain instances for damages, additional damages under 715 which are incidental and consequential damages. Now let's take a look at some examples of how this would work. So let's take the Wilson versus Hayes case in your book at 408. This is an example of a buyer who was in the market to buy bricks, used bricks. They contracted uh, with another, with a seller to buy 600,000 used bricks. When they counted up the bricks that were delivered, they discovered that 200,000 of the bricks were not delivered but had been paid for in advance. And as a result, they sued for damages as a result of the failure to deliver these 200,000 bricks. So now, what are their remedies? What type of contract is this is the first question to be asked. Well, bricks are a good. They are movable, and therefore they are a good under the UCC, and therefore the UCC will govern the sale of these goods. Okay. Now, let's start looking at our available remedies. 711, 2-711 says that we may cancel and recover so much of the price paid. Well, they had paid for all of the bricks in advance. So they may cancel the contract at the point of the failure to deliver and obtain their money back on the 200,000 bricks that weren't delivered. So they get to return the price of the 200,000 bricks, which were at a penny a brick, which equals $2,000. So that's one component of their damages in this case. Let's go on. Again, they failed to deliver 200,000 bricks. So now, 712 says they can cover and recover the difference in the contract price and the price of cover. But in this case, they didn't cover. They didn't, Wilson did not go out into the market and attempt to buy or buy the needed or the 200,000 bricks that weren't delivered. Uh, but this isn't the end. Again, damages are cumulative. Under the UCC, they are not exclusive. And under this carries forward the general principle of the failure to use one damage does not preclude another damage or remedy. So let's see where we go from here. Again, failed to deliver 200,000 bricks. 713 provides for the recover of damages for non-delivery or repudiation equals the difference in the market price when the buyer learned of the breach and the contract price plus incidental and consequential damages. In this case, there are a number of questions that are easily answered. Well, when did the buyer learn of the breach? Obviously, he learned of the breach when he counted the bricks after they had been delivered and learned that they had failed to deliver 200,000 bricks. The court found in this case, and obviously the buyer had presented evidence, that the market price in that locality was five cents a brick for used bricks. When you take that, you take the contract price of one cent a brick, you take the difference, which equals four cents a brick, times the 200,000 bricks, you get $8,000, okay, which would be the amount of their damages. That is what the damage would cost. That's what it would have cost in the difference between the market price and the contract price in this instance, and that is what the plaintiff will recover in part. Now, there's more to this because Wilson wants lost profits. Wilson was in the business of reselling bricks and had he gotten all the remaining 200,000 bricks from Hayes, he would have been able to sell them and make a profit 
of $6,250 for these non-delivered bricks. This is a consequential damage. This is directly flowing from the contract, and in this instance there are some questions that would have to be asked because it flows. So the, the 715 on consequential damages, loss of particular requirements and needs of which the seller at the time of contracting had reason to know and could have been prevented by cover or otherwise. So, but Wilson wants his lost profit still. We've got consequential damages. There are two questions that need to be asked in order to resolve the consequential damage issue. One is, did Hayes have reason to know of resale and therefore the profits? In this case, I think it's going to be pretty clear that Hayes knew that Wilson was in the business of reselling bricks and making profits from them. The next question is, could the lost profits have been prevented by cover or otherwise? Remember 715 has that clause at the end, which could have been prevented by cover or otherwise. How did these get answered? That's going to be up to you. Read the Hayes, Wilson versus Hayes case, and you'll see how the court resolves those, and this is generally how courts resolve them in most instances. There are a few remaining questions in buyer's remedies where a seller breaches. Under 713, remember I referred to the clause when the buyer learned of the breach. When the buyer learned of the breach, there's going to be, this is not an issue that is readily resolvable in all instances. So you're going to need to read in the book how courts have resolved this issue at times, and the courts are not consistent in how they resolve when the buyer learned of the breach. Another question, could not reasonably be prevented by cover or otherwise? Does this always require that the buyer cover? So must the buyer cover in all instances? Again, um, the cases in your book will deal with this issue and provide some guidance on how it is resolved. Another question, general or particular requirements and needs under 715, does this include lost profits? And as we talked about earlier, it in most instances does, but what type of lost profits? And again, you're going to need to look at the cases and determine how courts divide up lost profits and how they get measured and what proof is needed to demonstrate the loss of profits. Finally, what is required to prove lost profits and when will they not be permitted as damages? Obviously, the amount of proof and what is going to be necessary will determine whether a plaintiff can obtain the remedy for lost profits. This now concludes video lecture one in the remedies course. After you complete this video, please remember to go ahead and complete the video lecture assessment that will be found on the TWIN page.